I love food. Everything about food, especially cooking it. For many people, though, cooking is a mental obstacle course and not an enjoyable one. As a culinary nutrition educator, people often ask me, what do I cook for myself? What's my specialty? I cook from intuition. Now I realize intuitive cooking may not carry the same sex appeal as nouveau French, Asian fusion, nose to tail cuisine, but it encapsulates my approach to cooking and how I teach others to cook for health and happiness. I cook according to how I'm feeling, what's in season, if I'm craving sweet, salty, or savory, and what inspires me. When I look at an onion, I see 10 different ways to cut it and about 50 ways I could use it in a recipe. When someone else looks at that same onion, though, they may think of 50 other things they could be doing instead of chopping, or the associations of heartburn and watery eyes come up. And when I look at a cabbage, I think of my mom's stuffed cabbage she makes every Jewish high holiday season. When someone else looks at that same cabbage, they might think, I lost 10 pounds on a cabbage diet. Or they can't fathom how to cut it open, especially this one. Or there's my client who says, I don't eat cabbage. It gives me gas. Gastronomy philosopher Jean Briant Severn is famous for saying, show me what you eat and I will tell you what you are. I like to say, show me how you cook and I will tell you who you are. Do you follow a recipe to the T or can you open your refrigerator and come up with something balanced and delicious out of just a few ingredients? Do you make chicken and potatoes almost every night of the week? Or are you comfortable experimenting with vegetables week to week? The kitchen is a daunting room in the house for many people. Time, kids, money, conveniences of takeout, these all get in the way of us spending more time in the kitchen. One of the hallmark traits of a trained chef is the ability to cook intuitively. But, you don't need to go to culinary school to be able to do this. And you don't need to watch whole seasons of Top Chef. Yeah. What I notice is when I'm working either with a group of doctors or a group of soccer moms, I see the same thing over and over. When we use more of our intuition in the kitchen, we find greater pleasure in what we eat, how we eat, and how food can impact our health and our life for that matter. Cooking is in our DNA. Studies show, though, we are losing this inborn ability generation to generation. In fact, a third of Americans don't know how to cook. It seems like a, a prize characteristic today to be able to cook well, right? We have more celebrity chefs than we've ever seen before, more cooking competition shows than shows that actually teach you how to cook. We call ourselves foodies, and we have the waistlines and rates of disease to prove it. When we tap into our inner cook, though, we find more than what pleases just our stomachs, but our spirits, too. So why is intuition so relevant to this topic of the pursuit of happiness? Well, just as we use art, music, dance, and writing to express ourselves, Cooking allows us to tap into that creative side of our brain, too. And when we use intuition, we tap into the limbic or emotional side of our brain, that brain which helps us feel nurtured. Makes sense, right? How we feed ourselves can be extremely nurturing. Extremely nurturing. Intuition transcends logic and reason. It explains a more qualitative state of mind. And what I mean is it's the difference between following a recipe by the book versus experiencing all the tastes and smells that go into a dish and knowing just how to adjust it to your liking. Inevitably, in every class I teach, there's a student 
that finishes his or her dish and says, chef, I'm done. And I say, did you taste it? And that student says, no. How do I know what it should taste like if I've never had it before? And I say, it should just make you go, mmm. Right? What I've noticed is the natural ability our ancestors once had behind the stove has been replaced by fear. The fear of what to eat and how to prepare it. Part of what keeps people out of the kitchen is fear of food itself. We get caught up in what I call the food court. I don't mean the one at the mall. I mean the one that we've created around good food versus bad food. We're in a state of culinary confusion today. And I know this by what I hear in the cooking classroom. It goes something like this. Chef, is cooking in olive oil OK? What about coconut oil? What's up with gluten? Is soy bad for us? Should we be soaking our nuts and grains? Should we all be eating paleo? You can see why I have to start my classes with some sort of meditation and deep breathing. Right? The, the fear and anxiety people come in with around food is palpable. And I can relate to this anxiety around food. For years, I suffered from an undiagnosed chronic digestive condition. Well, diet was nowhere in the conversation with my doctors. But I knew that food could heal me just as it was upsetting my body. I was so afraid of what to eat that cooking became one scientific experiment after another. Whether I tried vegan, vegetarian, macrobiotic, paleo, low-carb, dairy-free, I'd feel good initially, but then end up feeling just as sick. I lived, like many people do today, treating myself as a culinary test tube, if you will, trying one extreme diet after another. I was so afraid of the physical pain and emotional unease after a meal, I micromanaged my diet to the point that eating was not pleasurable anymore, and cooking well, the kitchen felt like a spider web I was trapped in. It wasn't until years later I studied more of nutrition and mind-body medicine, I understood the connection between a stressed-out mind and a stressed-out gut. It's why we often refer to the gut as the second brain, because many of our neurotransmitters and hormones in the brain also reside in the gut. So I realized there was no magic pill to eating. But I wonder, does nourishment have to feel so difficult, so mental? It must be more intuitive. I mean, we've been eating and cooking for eons after all, right? Well, while walking in my hometown of Pennsylvania, I opened up a health magazine and I found the Natural Gourmet Institute in New York City. You can picture the yogic version of the CIA. You learn much more than classic French and Asian technique, but where your food comes from, the supply chain, health and nutrition, and it was really a holistic approach to sustainability through the culinary arts. I learned how to properly prepare beans and sea vegetables, tempeh and coconut and spelt. I had never eaten so cleanly in all my life. But different than years prior where I thought I was eating healthy, I didn't feel compelled to micromanage my diet so much because all of the flavors were so satisfying and my body felt good most of all. We didn't use much butter and meat at the Natural Gourmet, I'll be honest, both of which I happen to love and, and eat today. But we learned seven core principles of healthy eating and cooking that I use no matter who or where I'm teaching. And they are to choose whole. Whole foods, you can identify all of their edible parts. In essence, what nature provides us. The second is traditional foods. <clears throat> Humans from all corners of the world have discovered traditional ways of eating. It's why we find benefits from so many different diets, because they each draw on ideas that have been life-sustaining for 500 years or more. And by the way, traditional foods like yogurt, sauerkraut, kefir, kimchi, these not only feed the good bacteria of our guts, but they feed the brain. Food that's been treated with exogenous chemicals, hormones, antibiotics, or have undergone DNA modification, these are not traditional. 
organic whenever possible, seasonal, rotating your foods, not eating strawberries 24-7, 365, local, because local will oftentimes taste better, be more nutrient dense, and support your community. And by the way, the, the beautiful food back here I sourced from Beach Plum Farm right down the road, as well as a Union Square Farmers Market in New York City. So thank you to them. Eating in balance. When we get this colorful spectrum on the plate throughout the day, we obtain the essential vitamins and minerals, phytonutrients, and fiber that we need. And the last one, the one that I feel like really made the tuition at culinary school worth it, was that it has to be delicious. Doesn't matter how healthy the meal, if it's not delicious, you probably won't eat it, at least not over the long haul. Intuition in the kitchen is not an easy concept to explain. How do you know how to mix and match ingredients and bring out the flavor so it's completely satisfying? I can't teach you that in less than 18 minutes. But I have four tips to cultivating greater intuition. The first one I mentioned, but it's worth repeating, is quality. The quality of your ingredients is king in the kitchen. From a culinary stance, I stress organic and local and seasonal, not because these words are trending, but because when you choose your ingredients mindfully, you're oftentimes starting out with maximum flavor. You don't have to do too much to your cooking when your ingredients have been grown and harvested with so much care. The second is to bring all of your senses to the kitchen. Cooking is a complete sensorial experience taste being the primary one. This is why it's important to taste as you go, so that you know if a dish is overwhelming, underwhelming, or it just makes you go, mmm. Salt is usually what people underuse, right? And if a dish is still flat, you probably need some lemon or vinegar to bump it up. Too bitter, it probably needs some good healthy sweetener from maple syrup or honey. And fat, is a flavor enhancer too. So don't be afraid to use it in moderation. Your taste buds will guide you in the kitchen. The third is to unfollow a recipe or use visualization. Visualization is something I often did as a dancer growing up. Before a performance, I would sit in the corner quietly and run through an entire piece in my head. And this is something I still do today as a chef. It's true, chefs, we dream about food. It's where I've gotten a lot of my ideas from. So let's say I want to make my mom's stuffed cabbage, but I'm going to make it vegetarian. I might visualize sauteing up some mushrooms for that umami flavor that we get in veal. And then I'll add in some garlic and herbs and maybe some beans for protein. And I'll combine that with some brown rice to bulk it up. And then I'll take that and stuff that into the cabbage leaves, making some bundles. And I'll braise those cabbage bundles in caramelized onions, tomatoes, and more herbs. You're going to lunch next, so I'm trying to get you hungry. <laughs> the last one is fearlessness. The opposite of fear is love. I'm sure you all have a food memory where when you think about that dish, you start to salivate, and you think about the love that went into it. Our energy goes into the food that we make, and it affects the taste and how we digest it. So the next time you're cooking for yourself or somebody else, pay attention to what's going on inside. The most important ingredient you could add is your love. We all have a unique relationship to food. Right? That translates into how we cook. Eating may be our common denominator, but cooking is our unique expression of love. So to find that intuitive cook is to find sustaining health and nourishment on every level. In essence, the kitchen could be any area in your life you seek a more complete and mindful relationship with. So while it's easy, to get caught up in the politics of food, the judgments of our choices, whether we eat for pleasure or eat for health, let's not forget to enjoy our time in the kitchen. 
bringing greater happiness to your life and those you share it with. And I'd like to leave you with a quote by E.B. White. I rise in the morning torn between the desire to save the world and the desire to savor the world. This makes it difficult to plan the day. <laughs> Let cooking be time well savored. Your body and mind will thank you. And I thank my mom so much for all the hours in the kitchen together. Yes, that's me on the right. Thank you so much for being here.